guys, here we go. So um, I'm happy to have uh, our uh, Sandra Burkhardt here, who's from the Western States Petroleum Association. She's going to be telling us uh, about some of the goings on with regards to oil and gas uh, production and extraction. Here, sort of the big picture, but also specifically here in our part of the world. Um, I've asked her to give us some broad view of the industry overall and also to talk um, particularly about our offshore uh, oil and gas development. So um, she's going to do all that. Let me tell you a little bit more about Sandra. She is the senior coastal coordinator for WISPA, and uh, she does a lot of work with policy development, onshore, offshore stuff. Um, used to be with right, Ventura Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been with WISPA for? Um, three and a half years. About. Three and a half years. Okay, cool. And um, and she just had a baby. We should give her. We should give her. <laughs> support, <laughs> support the working moms of the world that, that still come here to talk to you guys because they have that much uh, respect for you guys to, to come here. <laughs> um, so anyway, so Sandra, I'll let her uh, go and, and introduce. We're going to cover a couple different <laughs> subjects. We'll have a, a break after a little while so you guys can stretch. Um, but other than that, uh, Sandra, take it away. Great, and thank you. if you want, we can, we can do this if it's a little better light. For all of you. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So thank you for having me. It's, uh, this is part of what I've been doing a lot of lately is coming out and providing uh, educational information about the industry. Uh, I do have a fairly casual approach, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I think it's easier than just letting me talk my way through because I could talk the class is over and then you wouldn't get to ask your questions and I think uh, it's more important to have that kind of interaction back and forth than for me to just sit up here and talk the whole time. So um, essentially I'm going I'm to give you a brief industry overview and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about a couple of specific industry issues that I think may be of interest to all of you today. Um, and then maybe we'll take a break and then the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today is offshore production. So. Um, again, I, I do a lot of presentations. I do a lot of policy development. I cover um, all of California for WISPA. WISPA is a nonprofit trade association, and what we do is we, we're kind of like a chamber. We represent the oil and gas industry, and we represent the big players. So my members um, are Chevron and Exxon and uh, those types of people, and it's my job to be their local advocate. I'm not a lobbyist, but I'm their local advocate. So I work on the ground out here um, across the state finding out what the issues are, and then it's my job to uh, reach out to decision makers, legislators, policy decision makers, those types, and get industry at the table with them so that they can work out their issues and try to find um, balanced government. So that's a little bit about what I do. Okay, so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea about our energy consumption in California. Um, and as you can see, 96% of California's transportation fuels are petroleum-based, so that's gas, diesel, and jet fuel. <clears throat> this is really telling for how much we actually consume. So in California, this is just California, we consume 43 million gallons of gasoline, 14 million gallons of diesel fuel, and 11 million gallons of jet fuel every day. That's almost 3 million gallons of fuel every hour, every day, 365 days a year. So we use a lot of, of, of fuel based in our economy. Um, and when you look at us as a nation, we're the third largest fuel consuming entity on earth behind the U.S. as a whole and all of China. So again, this is just California. I think if we go look at the 405 in L.A., it gives us kind of a, a perspective of how many cars there are, how many people there are, and how much we use this energy. This is an old slide, so I apologize, but it just kind of gives you an idea of, um, these are 2011 figures, but an idea of how many barrels of oil we produce per year. And I don't know how many of you realize this, but Ventura County is actually, you know, third or fourth largest producer in the entire state. Um, this community was founded on agriculture and oil, and it's a, a very big part of our economy even today. Um, looking at the energy reality as far as uh, where we're at now with regards to our demand and the potential for renewable energy sources, this is from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, and this essentially shows us, as you can see from the graph, that 80% of our needs will still come from fossil fuels. So as much as we would like to move into the renewable space, it's not a reality right now, unfortunately. Um, and that's where hopefully bright minds like yours will find ways to get us there in the future. Um, but the reality check here is that we're not there. So we need to try to move in that direction in the long term because fossil fuels are a finite resource. 
But the reality is that until we can get there and find a way to get there, um, we are going to need fossil fuels, so we need to try to do that responsibly. Uh, this is just a quote from President Obama. For the first time in nearly two decades, we now produce more oil here at home than we buy from the rest of the world. And our all of the above strategy for new American energy means lower energy costs. And I think this is just telling to the fact that it is important if we're going to produce energy that we should be doing it locally because we do have very high strict environmental standards and we certainly don't want to be getting it from other countries and other places that are enemies to us and also don't have the same level of environmental standards that we have. So this is a graph for those of you who like graphs and it kind of gives you an idea of our energy production versus consumption. As you can see from the diagram, the brown on the bottom is the production and the blue on the top is the consumption. So essentially what this is showing you is that we consume more than we produce right now. So um, we would like to get those together or if not, be, you know, even get the brown bar above the blue bar, but the reality right now is that we do consume more than we actually produce, which means we have to bring some in from other places. Um, this is just a nice quick graph to show you where our greenhouse gas emissions are. Um, we have, through advances in technology, um, the use of things like hydraulic fracturing, we have actually greatly reduced our carbon footprint and our greenhouse gas, um, greenhouse gas emissions are down at a 20-year low right now, which I think is a, a great thing. It's, it's something that we should be proud of. Um, as we continue to evolve in what we do as an industry and continue to evolve in the technologies and practices we use, this should only continue to drop on uh, the oil industry's part. And then there, just a couple of fun pictures um, to show you a little bit about the history of California. And I have to read these because I don't remember them all, but John Hamilton and Judge Lovejoy, who in 1864 dug shallow pits eight to 10 feet deep near active seeps in what, in what became known as the Asphalto area. They built a small still and refined the tar they collected into lamp kerosene, which was shipped by wagon to their agents in Stockton. So very old, way, very, very old. Um, this was Edwin Drake used a steam-powered cable tool rig to find oil at 69.5 feet. Grandin, assisted by blacksmith H. H. Dennis, uses the simple time-honored spring pull kick-down method for his well at, nearly, at nearby Gordon Run Creek. The well reaches a depth of 134 feet but produces no oil despite many attempts. We have come a long way since then, um, but it does give you an idea we have a very, very rich history in our country. And again, these are some old photos from parts of California. Um, and I'm going to go into Santa Barbara a little bit more later because Santa Barbara is actually where we um, conducted our first offshore. Um, so I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more later. And then this well, is... Know before Sandra keeps going on, that you guys look at those photos, right? It's sort of the story, it's a similar story to the issue with um, vehicles and pollution, right? We now maybe think of cars as big polluters now, but at the time, they were seen as an advance over mm -hmm. all this <laughs> so if you look at those, those coastal areas, you know, maybe some folks don't like wells now, but that's what it used to be like, right? So. Yeah, talk about lack of environmental standards and regulations. And so this, this just shows the gusher mentality, which is not in existence anymore. Um, I think oil companies would love to have gushers, but this is not reality anymore. This was back in uh, March 15th of 1910. This was called Lakeview Number 1. It came in with a roar from a depth of 2,225 feet and blew the crown block off the top of the derrick with an estimated initial flow of 100, 125,000 barrels a day, which is huge. And this actually continued unabated for 30 days, so there was an awful lot of oil coming out. Um, but this, again, is not our reality now, and it's because due to production, the pressures in the ground won't cause something like this. Plus, we have technology in place to ensure that we don't have gushers. And real quick, we'll talk about this later, but just to point out, that's the largest oil spill in U.S. history right mm -hmm. there. The Deepwater Horizon event was the largest marine, marine. oil yeah. spill. So, so just to make sure you guys don't get that wrong on the The largest <laughs> oil spill. And people oftentimes say that incorrectly. Like the, mm -hmm. Almost 100 years ago today, almost as the, as the water rises. And it was up in the Bakersfield area, Kern County. So. And then this is a picture of what today looks like. Uh, this is a lot different. There's high technology in use. This is what's called steam injection. 
I believe this picture is from one of the fields up in Santa Maria. So you can see we've come a long ways in how we develop, um, how we produce, and even in the design of our um, wells. And I'm going to show you some other pictures later. OK, so going back to California, again, third largest oil producer in the US at 580,000 barrels a day. So that gives you an idea, 580,000 barrels a day for the entire state. And we saw the Lakeview gusher, which was gushing 128,000 barrels a day. So you can see that production is not what it once was. Um, it's not the gold rush that it used to be. Um, we're also the 13th largest natural gas producer at 685 million cubic feet per day. We have 92% of the oil is produced onshore and 8% is produced offshore. And possibly part of the reason for this is due to the moratoriums that are in place and the inability to buy leases now, which we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, petroleum industry generates and supports about 468,000 jobs in California. And we generate about $21.5 billion in state and local tax revenues. And those two figures come from a um, LAEDC study that was commissioned and published in April of this year. So those are um, based upon surveys and study research that was done. And then I'm going to go over these really quickly, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what the wages are like. Um, the oil and gas industry is a fantastic industry to be in. Um, the average job, as you can see, pays six figures. Great benefits. I can tell you the benefits are incredible. Um, you know, obviously fossil fuels are not going away, so it's, it at least has a, a period of longevity. I don't know if I want my daughter to necessarily go into the oil industry, but um, for me, it's a very secure future. It doesn't necessarily require a high, high, high level of education. So for those of you, obviously, that are at the college, you would be fine for many of these jobs. Um, but for those that maybe don't want to go to college or maybe want to go to a trade school, there are a lot of great jobs available to those with those specific trades, $60,000, $80,000 a year. So it really is a fantastic uh, opportunity for folks to get into something that you know, maybe wouldn't be your standard four-year bachelor degree. And then again, these are employment figures. So the 468,000 jobs is a combination of direct, indirect, and induced. So the direct jobs are those that are direct employment into the industry. Indirect would be things like the contractor services, or the supplier of mud, or the water truck that waters the property to keep the dust down. So there's all kinds of jobs that come from that. And then the induced jobs would be basically those induced effects within your economy as a result of the industry being there. So a lot of the times you'll find the industry in places that most people wouldn't want to live in because you know it's not that great. But the oil industry comes in and they bring a lot of opportunity for economic development. They have to build homes for these people to live in. They go to the restaurants there. Um, so there's a lot of induced benefits from the industry as well. And then this gives you uh, some economic impacts relating to statewide, um, but I think I want to you can see this real quick, but what I really want to focus in on is the next one, which is Ventura County, since that's where we're at. So in Ventura County, we have almost 12,500 jobs from the industry. The um, income, the labor income is 740, 000, or 740 million almost. The uh, value added, 2.7 billion. And then on the very bottom, property taxes, 121.6 million. So if you look at the top 10 property taxpayers in Ventura County, at least three of those are oil companies. So um, though that money, the property tax money, obviously is really important to the county to be able to provide services, fire protection, public safety, school funding, things like that. So it's a, a large contributor here in Ventura County. OK, so that was just kind of a brief overview. And then I'm going to focus in on a couple, two industry issues in particular that I think may be interesting or valuable to you today. Um, the first one is something called AB32. Has anyone heard of that? OK. So AB32, um, it's actually a three-part um, three program. One piece had already started, um, which let me just double check the name of that piece. That was the cap and trade on stationary sources. That already went into effect. And as you can see, 2 to 8 cents per gallon was what we felt at the, at the pump. So it wasn't a huge impact. However, what is starting January 1st of 2015 is cap and trade for fuels. And so again, I'm going to go back to this right here. 14 to 69 cents per gallon is what we're all looking at next year at the tank. So it's a really substantial increase. So AB32, what is it all about? So this was a really cool diagram my communications director sent me the other day. 
that gives you kind of an idea of what this is all about. So the cap and trade piece of this is you've got, a, you've got the petroleum that comes out of the ground, right? And then it goes to a refinery, one of our 14 refineries in California. They refine it. Then the cap and trade auction, which is set by CARB, this California Air Resources Board, they auction off the carbon and they set a pretty variable price, actually, depending upon what the market trend looks like. So then they buy up these carbon credits, right? And then what ends up happening is that eventually those carbon credits go into the manufacturing costs and then eventually down to the pump where we as consumers pay for it. So that's why this is a big deal. It, it's a big deal for my members and for my industry, but it's also a big deal for us as consumers because ultimately, as we all know, any tax, anything done by the state at this point is going to trickle down into the community. So I felt like it was important to bring this up simply because this is a big deal. Uh, WISPA is, at this point in time, trying to get CARB to delay implementation until 2018. That's our hope. We haven't made a lot of headway, I'll, headway, I'll be honest with you. Um, they, don't wanna, they don't wanna halt. They, be, they don't believe that the costs are real, even though they absolutely are real. So WISPA has now launched a campaign, um, essentially to educate the public on what's coming, because probably most of you didn't know about this, right? You didn't know that you're gonna actually be paying higher gas prices next year because of this. Because most of us every day, we don't know about all this kind of stuff until it hits us, and then all of a sudden, we're sitting here looking at the gas prices, wondering why all of a sudden they're 20, 30 cents a gallon more than they were last year. So our hope is we're trying to provide a level of outreach and education to all of you to let you know that this is coming and you all can help us by supporting letters to your legislators, sending letters to CARB, showing up at any testimony opportunity you have, things like that to let them know that, hey, look, we don't wanna pay more at the, at the tank. We want you to figure out a way to make this more you know, stomach, stomach worthy for us, a, bit, a way that's gonna work for us. So that's what the cap and trade piece of this is. There's another piece of this called low carbon fuel standard, LCFS. That's the last piece here. One more piece of all this, and that is going to be 33 to $1.06 per gallon extra. And so again, these are, um, it's hard, these are huge ranges because it's hard to know for sure based upon whatever the auction's going to be, what the costs are gonna be for a lot of this. So I, I apologize that it's such a huge range, but it just gives you an idea of potentially where we're looking at increases. So when you see all of this, you wanna add all three of these together and whatever it is, even at the very lowest point, you can see it's going to be very substantial at the tank. So low carbon fuel standard, what is that? Again, it's part of the AB32 program. It requires fuel providers to reduce the carbon intensity of gasoline by 10% by the year 2020. Doesn't sound that big of a deal, right? 10% by 2020, but it is a big deal. Um, it's not actually feasible at this point, and multiple studies have been done to confirm that it's not feasible. The problem is that we don't have an, an adequate supply of low carbon intensity biofuels in order to get to that level. So, and you know, again, studies have been done to confirm this. So, you know, what we're doing is we've been going back to CARB, showing them these studies. Um, BCG is Boston Consulting Group. They're one of the, the well-known firms that have done some of this research to show them that we're headed toward a train wreck right now and they need to do something about it. So, And I'm not gonna go through all this because this was the diagram, but this essentially shows you um, potentially what we're looking at in the way of cost. And just so you know, CPG, it's cents per gallon. So. And then this just shows you a graph of what the carbon costs have been to show you how incredibly volatile and variable it can be, which is why the ranges of the impact are so vastly different because it all depends on what the carbon is selling for at that point in time. Okay, so again, I mentioned that we're trying to delay the implementation until 2018. And this is an example of um, you know, some of the ads we've been doing. You might see them on the internet or on TV. Um, we're really trying to educate the public about what's happening, what's coming your way, and how you can help. So this is my little plug for uh, CaliforniaDriversAlliance.org. It's a huge coalition of people like you that have signed on together, that assist us when we put out calls to action for signing on to letters and things like that. So if anyone's real passionate about this issue and wants to support us, you can go to that website. 